This is Trek Zone's That Time When. Welcome to the final edition of That Time When. I am Matt Miller in the Trek Zone studio. This is the podcast where I take you back through the Trek Zone archive, catching you up on episodes that you might have missed, or if you've been hanging around the channel for long enough, maybe it's been a little while since you've caught up on this one. It's been buried by all of our new content. We're up to the start of 2020, and unfortunately, we won't be going any further. Trek Zone TV launches 6 a.m. January 1, 2023, and it's taking over the mantle of the retrospective into the Trek, the deep dive into the Trek Zone archive. So be on the lookout for that. The DVR function will be enabled for that stream so you can rewind up to 12 hours uh, on the stream and catch up on what you might have missed. I'm still working on hopefully getting an electronic program guide together so that uh, you know exactly when things are there and maybe you can catch up on them. Uh, but be on the lookout on trekzone.org for that. Right now, you are watching this episode of That Time When to catch up on the time when Melinda Snodgrass beamed in. She was the writer of The Measure of a Man from TNG's second season. Introducing us to Bruce Maddox. Bruce Maddox obviously became a pretty integral part of the first season of Star Trek Picard. So what better way to uh, discuss the character's progression than by chatting to the person who created the character, Melinda Snodgrass, on this edition of That Time When. Thanks so much for watching these 98 episodes of the podcast and uh, do check out Tracks on TV when it launches 6am January 1, 2023. Right now though, let's catch up on that time when we met Melinda Snodgrass. Well, Melinda, welcome to Trekzone. Thank you very much, Matthew, for inviting me. I'm really excited to be part of this. It is a great thrill to uh, to have you on the show. And as I said in the intro there as well, uh, the roots of a Trekzone conversation is interviewing every sci-fi alumni in the world. So it is great that you're here with us uh, to, to chat about uh, your writing uh, across, across the years. Well, I've been doing it for a long time after I decided I, I did not want to be a lawyer anymore. I got, I got much better. I'm a, I'm a reformed lawyer now. But, uh, and, and I had dear friends who were writers, and they encouraged me to try, and I did. And it's been a career that has been so incredibly rewarding for me. I, I'm very grateful to them for all the support over the years. Well, some of your writing credits uh, include creating a couple of series of books. There's Edge, Imperial and Circuit, all different sets of stories with a few years between them. Uh, what inspired you to create them? A lot of these series come out of my, my education, actually. Um, the Circuit books are about a federal court judge writing Circuit in Outer Space because I was trained as an attorney. Um, and I also have another series that I had written under pseudonym, which we're bringing back out now under my own name, about a young woman lawyer working in a vampire law firm in Manhattan um, that draws a lot on, on some of my experiences. And even Imperials, which is a space opera, um, I'm much more interested in how societies in crisis function and deal with these problems of class differences and growing inequality. Um, so it's less about, about spaceships shooting each other and, and more about marginalized people and humans as the evil invading aliens instead of the other way around. And then the Edge books were my reaction to the fact that we're in the 21st century and there are still people who put more credence in crystal power and guardian angels and getting their auras balanced than they do in science and medicine and and just rationality. Um, so the Edge books are about the war between science and rationality and superstition, religion, and magic. And I come down on the side of rationality. And in some ways, that also ties back into the law because... Um, you know, without without law, civilization is not possible. One thing I love is that you said you were a lawyer uh, and you've written some books about lawyers uh, in sci-fi settings. Does it help bring a sense of realism uh, to write about stuff that you know? You know, I think it helps. I don't think it's required. I think, I think teachers who tell students that you can only write what you know, well, none of us have met aliens, so those of us who are writing science fiction are not going to be able to, you know, write from our experience. But I do think that anything you studied and learned can can add to what you bring to your writing and, and enriches it and deepens it. When I lecture, I do a lot of guest lectures at, at universities and even some high schools, 
I always urge the students to, you know, stay in school. I sound like a little, you know, the, the principal when giving a little lecture. I'm serious about this because nothing that you learn is ever wasted as a writer. Um, even to the point of sitting in a coffee shop. I mean, we're terrible eavesdroppers. We'll sit and overhear conversations because, and you never know when that's going to end up in somebody's book. And we just hope that person we eavesdropped on is, is not going to recognize themselves. We try to be careful, but we really are students of the world, you know, as writers, uh, you know, just pulling it all in and this sort of amorphous way of saying, give me everything so that I can pour it back out on a page. Well, you wrote some stories for Sequest DSV, The Outer Limits, of course, Star Trek, uh, and many more, uh, a credits list across many genres. What's your favourite to write for? You know, whatever it is I'm doing in the moment, I fall in love with it, which I think is good. Um, it's awful to write something that you're not passionate about. I mean, obviously, I think my first love is science fiction. Um, my dad would read aloud to me when I was a little girl before he taught me to read. And the book he read to me was 20,000 Leagues of the Sea. And then the very first novel I read sort of all by myself as a child was a, Edgar Rice Burroughs' A Princess of Mars. And so I think that ultimately science fiction is always going to have my heart. Um, I mean, the idea of exploring the universe and seeing distant planets and hopefully meeting, you know, new new races of people is just always fired my imagination. Uh, and, you know, on balance, I, I read both. I enjoy both fantasy and science fiction, but my heart is with science fiction because I, I want to reach for the future, I guess. Well, there are some obvious differences between writing a novel and, and writing a screenplay for TV. Uh, as, as a writer, is it hard to switch gears between the two? Uh, you know, I don't find it that difficult. I'm told that's a little bit unusual, but I think on balance I was born to be a screenwriter because even my novels are very very dialogue heavy um, and I often forget to put in descriptions that description is the bane of my existence um, that was in my in our writers group it was inevitably great dialogue Melinda where are they they could be in a white room <laughs> you know and so I try very hard now to involve the five senses. But there are moments when switching back and forth, I was in the midst of writing a script and writing one of the Edge novels, and I was working very fast to get something to submit to the writers group and got to the meeting and uh, everyone was laughing at me because I had written on this one particular chapter, interior bedroom night. And then I then I went into the scene, um, and I was just sort of in that moment. You know, I think it's just a matter of um, sitting down and thinking about where you are. Uh, you know, the beauty of screenwriting is that you do so much with so little, and I love that. It's like, how much can you pack into a single line of dialogue? And of course, you know, you're ultimately hoping you're gonna have a wonderful actor to deliver that line of dialogue and, and sell all the subtext that you built into it. I mean, in, in novels, we can just tell you what the character is thinking and feeling, and finding a way to do it subtly in, in a screenplay is just really exciting to me. I guess a novel has a bigger budget, if you will. Uh, you, you're not really <laughs> constrained by uh, by production costs. Exactly. Um, and even more so, I've, I've written a couple of graphic novels. I have a graphic novel that, please God, once the artist finishes, he's doing such a beautiful job, but it's taking a long time. It's a wild cards graphic novel. I mean, if, if being a novelist, you feel like the, you've got it all... When I wrote these graphic novels, you really are the director and the set designer and, you know, describing even the, to the point of, you know, the light comes in through the window. I mean, you're telling the artist what you want in the panels. And um, to me, that was sort of the the ultimate no holds barred, no budgetary constraints, no no worries about any of those other issues. 